Good morning, everyone. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, we come before you on this semi-rainy, semi-sunny day that you have created for us. Lord, we are thankful to be alive. We're thankful that there are breath in our lungs to give you the praise and worship that is due to your name. Lord, we thank you for all the hard work that has gone out through the last months preparing for what's coming. And today we lift up 72 young souls who will be coming to the Vacation Bible School. We, we lift up 40, almost 50, almost 50 families. And Lord, we lift up all the workers and all of our congregation this morning. As we lift our prayers to you and ask that your Holy Spirit would move in their lives, would move in our lives, that you would be present all over these grounds, that your angels and all the people who will be working will be protected, but also that the joy of the singing of heaven that sings forever would be in our hearts and we would be able to share the beautiful, beautiful story of the saving gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all of God's people said, amen. 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 Let's stand to worship. Well, welcome once again. And we have a few songs we're going to sing to um, enter that time of worship and praise. And this first song is one we haven't done in a while. It's a song that says, great is the Lord and he is holy and just. Let's, uh, let's lift our voices up to him this morning. Great is the Lord, he is holy and just. By his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is holy and true. By his mercy he in his love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory. Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord. Lift up your voice now. Lift up your voice. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. He is holy and just. By his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord. He is faithful and true. By his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory. Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord. Now lift up your voice. Now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of glory. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord, now lift up my voice. I lift up my voice. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, with that, him being great, we know we can lean on him. We can trust on him. And the song is, talks about how we can lean on his everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, 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 
us safe and secure from all alarm. Leading us, leading us, leading on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning us, leaning us, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning us, leaning us, leaning on the everlasting earth. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Lord Jesus, leaning, Jesus, leaning, Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leading on the everlasting arms, leading on the everlasting arms.
move to this next song. Um, we'll use this time to collect our off, collect our, uh, be able to come up and give our offerings here. In, if you're here in person, and if you're on, watching online and you wish to donate, um, you can do so at ClintonNazarene.org. Uh, and if you wish to, to sit down, you can sit. If you wish to remain standing, you can do that. At, you can do that too. Nothing can stand against 
What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. he was betrayed he offered up the bread blessed are you O God king of the universe creator of the bread of the field and he broke the bread and he said this is a new covenant and my body is broken for you so that your sins may be forgiven and then he offered up the third cup of the redemption of the wine. Behold the new covenant in my blood. So heaven's gates are opened. And the way to the Holy of Holies is open for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I ask you now to come forward and partake of the body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to your soul's comfort and joy and the thought of seeing him face to face one day. And all of God's people said, come forward. this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but humbled himself and became a little lower than the angels, taking on human form, that he should suffer the cross. And because of this, God gave him the name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Take now his body for your strength this week. And his blood to wash <laughs> you clean again. And now it's time for Kids Connection.
Good morning. Are you guys awake? Yeah. So we've been doing some stories about Jesus, right? And today we're talking about Jesus called his disciples. Hmm. I wonder what the word disciple means. Does anybody have an idea? We just follow Jesus. We follow what he says, what he does, right? What he wants us to do, right? It's following him. Yeah. Yeah. Follow the leader. Jesus is our leader. So this story is, well, he called, he called 12, 12, but that was for them. And he, after that, he calls us all, right, to be a disciple. So this story isn't really about all of them because they weren't all in one place at the same time when he called them. But this kind of is about some fishermen. Have you guys ever been fishing? You have? Charles has. Okay. Asher remembers it. And Melanie? Okay. Twice. Good. So fishing, yeah, they did this as their job, right? It wasn't just like for fun or here and there. They did it for their job. So they had to go out and cast their nets and it was a hard work, right? And so they would sometimes get a bunch and sometimes none, right? So, um, you know, the thing is, is Jesus went up to them. Does anybody know any other names? Right? Peter? Andrew? James and John? Yeah, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Okay, and, and they were brothers. Well, two sets of brothers, yeah. <laughs> so they were they were with their boats, and I think they're just they were either coming in or going out to go fishing. And you know what Jesus said? follow me. You know what it says? They dropped their nets and they followed him. Wow. So we need to be like that, right? Whatever Jesus wants us to do when he wants us to follow him and do what he wants us to do, we're just going to say, okay, we're going to follow you, Jesus, right? That's how we can be the disciples. Do you know that even kids can be? Did you know that? You guys and the big kids out there, those big kids out there, they can, they can, we can all be disciples. We have to follow, follow Jesus. So we have to read the Bible. Um, coming to church is important too, right? All those things, following Jesus. And uh, I want to let you know that um, I have a song. I don't always have a song. This is kind of an older song, but maybe you'll catch on, okay? It goes like this, and I'll let you sing it the second time. Are you ready? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back no turning back. Can you guys say that? You can, even if you don't know the tune, you can say, I have decided to follow Jesus. You can say the words, right? You ready? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back right? So we can be his followers, his disciples. Let's pray. Before we pray, I want you to know that that song was written by two sisters who lived on the island across from West Point. And they wrote it for the soldiers. The young cadets, every time when they would go to, to breakfast and lunch, they would sing that song in cadence. Have you ever noticed it's actually a cadence? I have decided to follow Jesus, left, left, right, left. And they actually had five verses to it. 
And that's about how long it took them to march from the parade grounds to get to the, to the factory, the factory, that's what we call it, the military, uh, or, or mess to go get the food. And um, they lived on that island and they'd never married and they just prayed for souls all their life. Amazing story. So look it up. It's a crazy, it, it, a lot of that's lost to history, but we learned that when we were at West Point. So, all right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your Bible, the word, your word, Lord, and that has this wonderful story and at how you called your disciples back then when you were on the earth. And now you still call all of us all of us, if we're little kids, big kids, or somewhere in between, you want us to follow you and do what you want us to do and be what you want us to be and act how you want us to act. So I just pray that you would help us and give us the strength to be good disciples, good, to, good followers of you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's look at some announcements for the day. So we're finally there. We got one more rope to pull that's already rigged there. Five or six more posters to put up, some chairs to rearrange, and it begins. The assault, the assault, that's what it is. So um, we're, we, have, uh, we have four groups and um, we're looking forward to 72 kids we had 72, two canceled, and there were two that, that begged us to take them, so we're back at 72. Um, God just keeps blessing and blessing and blessing. But I want to stop, stop right now, and I want to pray for all of the workers and all the people who have supported this. So if you have been working at all, or plan to work at all, or plan to make food for Friday, or plan to do anything, make cookies in the background, please rise, because I want to pray for you. Father in heaven, things like this don't happen by chance. Your Holy Spirit goes out and you call souls. Your spirit works within us to give us joy and arms and feet to bring the gospel. It's come through so many preparations. But if you look at that little poster on the back wall with 17 children two years ago, then COVID, which tried to stop everybody from living, and now this year to 72, we stand in awe of you. We ask you by your Holy Spirit to bless these workers. Bless everything that we do. May every utterance of our mouth, every thought of our heart be only of you, Holy One. And may these children come to know you, the living God. May their families come to know you through their exuberance and their joy. I thank you for my people that you have given me in this place, called by your name. My heart is overflowing with love, gratitude, and joy. Thank you for this people called by your name, Holy One in heaven, and all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. The next one is next Sunday, this will be a children's service. Every song, everything that's done, except maybe an announcement or two will be done by the kids, Melinda and all the workers. Okay. So we're going to be wearing our shirts for about a week and all that's going to go on. After which Melinda and I will be gone for a couple of weeks on vacation. First one we've taken in a long time. I need it. I got to be honest with you. I'm burnt. Um, I want to thank ahead of time, one of our people in our church for giving us their cabin in Maine. We're just going to disappear. I'm turning off the phone. And if you can't find me, you can't find me. Okay. Um, but the bottom line is this, there'll be a lot of follow-up work, a lot of families, a lot of excitement going on after this. I'm depending on every one of you 
open hands, reaching out, inviting all the new people. Here's what I love about this church. Everyone who has remained in the three years that I've been here, everyone who has joined in that same three years has an open heart to accept people immediately. They move right over. They bump elbows together. They work hard and they love one another. And that's what we want them to see because that's who we are. Amen. We're God's people. And I'm depending on you, okay? When I come back, we'll pick it up right where we left off, God willing. And now for an exciting announcement. Just read. It's a girl. The new baby, the new baby is a girl. So the other day, Melanie was like, oh, please, God, let her be a sister. And I said, Melanie, that's wonderful. All little girls pray for a sister, but you get what God gives you. Will you be happy if it's a brother? Yes. <laughs> and then I, the, I was preparing her, but everybody kept saying it's a boy. I kept saying it was a girl. Uh, there's a reason for that. I love Frank, but he needs, a humil he needs humility. <laughs> I love Frank, but he needs to taper down the boy stuff and become a little bit more girl stuff. And God has a way of just giving you exactly what you need in your life to round you and form you. And a daughter is a perfect place to start. We are thankful for God's continued grace and gift of children. Isn't that one unbelievable? So congratulations. Let's go on to the word of God this morning. We're back in the book of Acts for a whole week. <laughs> and children's service, and then I'm gone for two, and then we're back again. But I've, I've, I've labored in love over this sermon. Um, and so let's take a look at the word from chapter eight of the book of Acts written by Luke. But there was a certain man called Simon Magnus, who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people throughout Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least of them to the greatest of them, they said, this man has the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for such a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized by water baptism of repentance. And Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued on with Philip. And he was amazed seeing the miracles and signs and wonders, which he did. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent along Peter and John up to them, who, when they had come down to them, prayed for them that they might receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. For as yet, he, the Spirit, had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized by the water baptism of repentance in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then they laid hands on them, and they received the fullness of the Holy Spirit by the fire baptism of indwelling. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money for this gift, saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay my hands might also receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter stood up and rebuked him and said, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God, the Holy Spirit himself, could be purchased by money. You, you have neither part nor portion in any of this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness, and pray to God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness, and you are bound by your iniquity. And Simon answered Peter, pray to the Lord for me. None of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. And so when the apostles continued to testify and preach the word of God, they returned back to Jerusalem, and on the way, they preached in many of the villages of the Samaritans, the word of God.
Sometimes I have really long titles and sometimes I have really short titles. But God literally pressed this into my mind. Two baptisms, receive two gifts. Tell the people what this means. So let's take a look at that. Two baptisms, two gifts. Anyone already looking at that title and going, what? Or does anybody have an idea what I think where, where I'm gonna go with this? Let me see, anybody? All right, let's start with the main character. Believe it or not, the main character is the Holy Spirit, but after that, it's this antagonist named Simon Magnus. Who is he? He's a sorcerer of dark magic and power. That's what we're told in the scripture. He uses the power of Satan and the dark world to perform mighty acts. Let's look at again what it was said about him. There was a certain man called Simon Magnus who previously practiced sorcery in the city, and he astonished many people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great. And to whom they all gave heed for at least from the least to the greatest saying, this man has, look at this, look at this title. This man has the great power of God. Now, what God? Well, they believed in many, so we'll get to that in a little bit. But they heeded him because he could do such great sorcery and he had done it for such a long period of time. Now, people say, oh, this isn't possible. You know, witches, Wicca, warlocks, folks, it is. Seen it. I have seen them do things you cannot explain because guess who's empowering them? Fallen angels, demons. Their power has not been relinquished. Satan still has all of his intelligence, all of his power. And they are here on the earth and they are here to bring down souls. What does Peter tell us? Satan, your adversary is like a lion prowling about in the grass, seeking what soul he may devour. Okay. And so this was really happening. It was no illusion like we see in, you know, Las Vegas and places like that. Was Simon Magnus ever mentioned again in scripture after this moment? And the answer is what? What do you think? No, absolutely not. He's only mentioned one time. Let me ask another question. Was he ever mentioned in any other extra biblical source of history? What do you think the answer is? She's got the notes, so she says, yes. Somebody, somebody, some, some students, I will tell you, actually read the notes as the teacher's talking. Uh, yes, he's mentioned a couple of times, actually, and he's mentioned with a lot of pomp and circumstance. So it isn't like he went missing in history. We'll get back to that a little bit later. Who, what was Simon's original antagonist in this countryside of Samaria? He was in control. Everybody was giving him money. They came to him for stuff. He had it made. Philip, the deacon of the, of the new Christian church, he's the antagonist. Believe it or not, isn't that crazy? The good guy is the antagonist. It's going to get reversed in a second because once the Holy Spirit comes, who's the good guy? Right? And who's the bad guy? Well, Satan and anybody who works for him. But right now, he's got this agonizing problem. This guy comes preaching the new word. He comes preaching a new idea. He comes preaching a new name. He comes preaching a new power. He comes preaching a new way. And all of a sudden, the apple cart has been tumbled, all right? Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ to them. And the, look what it says, and the multitudes with one accord, that's what the Holy Spirit does. He brings people into unity. They heeded everything that he spoke. They saw with their own eyes. They heard people testifying to the miracles that he was performing, the signs and the wonders, healing people in the streets. Unclean spirits. Did you hear that? The demons were being exposed, crying out, coming out of people who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed, and the lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city of Samaria. So the very things that Simon Magnus was doing in the opposite direction, Philip was doing in the other direction. And who was getting exposed? Satan. Does he like that? No. no, he does not. And he will do anything to keep himself hidden and in power. And they be, when they begin to believe Philip, the scripture tells us, everything that he preached concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women, meaning everybody of every age, was coming for baptism. What kind of baptism? A washing of repentance. You're sorry for your sins. 
The blood of Christ removes those sins, and a new life is formed in Christ. And the Holy Spirit, for the very first time, begins to speak. Oops, I think I went a little too far. No, I didn't. Sorry. Here we witness the first baptism, or what is called by God, the first gift of God. Okay? So who, who in here has been baptized? Raise your hand. Okay? We all have received, everybody who raised their hand, that first gift of the Holy Spirit. And if you have it, we can do that. We can take care of that by faith. What does, though, the first baptism of water and repentance do in the life of the believer? Now, little caveat here, a little off to the side. Are you ready? Many churches don't believe what I'm about to preach. I really feel sorry for them because this is the truth. There is two baptisms and there are two gifts. The Church of the Nazarene was literally founded upon the second gift of the Holy Spirit and how important he is in our life and all of his fullness. Our mission was to preach that very thing that most people deny. I know lots of Christians who have been baptized. They went to an altar one time. They said, hey, I'm saved. And that's the end of it. Matter of fact, about nine out of 10 Christians you meet, that's who they are. They don't know. It's not their fault. They don't know there's more to it than that. Guess whose fault that is? The preachers. Guess whose fault that is? The church. It's not theirs. My people perish for lack of knowledge. That's right in the Old Testament. My knowledge abounds and abounds. Satan's always making it. How fast does knowledge abound today? Do you realize that every second now that we lived, 264,000 times more information is being produced? It's like on this, it was like 132,000 last year. It just keeps multiplying. Knowledge is everywhere, but guess what? It's worthless stuff. And I love people, you know, they pick up their smartphones and they're like, oh, I'll Google that. And you think that's intelligence? A lot of times they pick sites that don't even matter. I'll give you an example. Aino Koivinen. There's a great Finnish name, eh? Aimo. You'd call him Andy. Where's Andy? He's here. There he is. Aimo. That's Finnish for Andy. He's this guy, this Finnish warrior that went up against the the invasion of the Soviet Reds in the winter offensive of 1939-1940. And my, my son-in-law and I were in the, in the room last night, and he said, hey, is this guy really real? I just read this meme. Memes. Got to love memes, right? Oh, yeah, because there's a lot of knowledge in that. You know what they said he did? Whacked out on all the amphetamines of his whole unit after they were overrun, went on a two-week rampage and killed all these Russians. And his heart rate was like 200 when they found him, and he was almost dead. He lost like 80 pounds or some crazy thing. And he skied like 400 miles. Yeah, right. The real story, I went downstairs. What did I pull off the shelf there, Angel? The Winter War, alphabetized by year, by war. Yeah, I know. I know exactly where the book was. It's the, it's the definitive thing of the Finnish-Russian War of the 1930s. Imo Koivinen really lived. He really did take two amphetamines a day, not 20, two. He really did ski 252 miles to get away. He really did kill 52 Russians over a period of two weeks. But he didn't, go, he didn't kill 900, and he didn't do 400 miles, and he didn't take 20 pills a day. And he wasn't a meth farm fanatic, right? But think about why a meme like that would get started. Because people have what? Drug problems. What do they want to do? Feel good about themselves. When we don't tell the true story of this, souls are lost. This is so serious, it's unbelievable. So what's the real story of baptism? We're so sorry for our sins, we can't live any longer being dirtbags to God and dirtbags to everybody else. I'm using military terms this morning. We want to stop this behavior. We're appalled by what we see in our lives. We know we are going to hell in a handbasket. We're sick of hurting people. We're sick of everything. And we want God to save us from the what we have become which is not what he made us to be, amen? He made us in his divine image. He made us to be lovely and pure and holy. He made us to serve and love and, and, and accept and forgive. It all starts with getting all that garbage out of our life. And, and that's what Christ's blood does. 
See, baptism is a serious thing. You're proclaiming to the whole world that you're going to be a disciple. Remember what Melinda was teaching this morning? You're going to be a follower of who? One person, Jesus. One God, Christ. And nothing else in your life will ever be in the way again. Amen? Amen. And you know what? It's cheap grace nowadays. Well, to get out of jail free card, get out of hell free card. You know what? You know, your sins are gone. Good to go. No, that's just the beginning. What that does is it opens us up and washes away all the crud. And then it exposes inside of us what's still not changed though, which is our nature. Sinful nature. See, I'm not talking about the sin now. I'm talking about the nature. Do you know what I'm talking about? You can see it in a two-year-old. Mine! And they take the doll and they hit the other one or pull the arm off rather than give it away. I watched this in my house. <laughs> or how about this? Slam the finger in the door because they're playing hide and go seek. And then, was it me? I was on my tablet. Was it me? I was playing with it. Was it me? Well, if there's only four of you and one of you is hurt. And the person didn't slam the door on themselves. Ooh, brain dead. But what is that? You know what that's a sign of? Sinful nature. I don't want to be in, I don't want to, ah, no, not me. I want to do what I want and I want you to leave me alone and don't tell me to change. Try to get two kids to hug after they do something wrong. Where does that come from in a three-year-old? I know I'm wrong, but I'm not going to do it. Do you love your brother? Yes. Can you hug him? No. And people tell me like, oh, kids are just, you know, no. See, inside of us is this thing where we just want to do it our way. We don't want to pay any price. We, we, don't, we don't want to put anything. What we really want to do is just kind of like have our cake and eat it too. You know, that's what Simon Magnus wanted to do. He just kind of wanted to get a little bit of God, but he wanted to keep on doing what he was doing. You see, repentance says this, I refuse to be who I was. I refuse to accept this anymore. I refuse to stay where I'm at. I need to move. And wherever God leads, I'm going to start that process. That's that first gift. Amen? The first gift is complete forgiveness. Not of some sin, all it is the, because of the perfect sacrifice of Christ that led a perfect life. And because he was God and because he was man at the same time, when he died once and for all, every sin can finally be forgiven. We don't believe in this church the sins of some are forgiven because they'll never get to heaven. We believe everybody's sins are forgiven. It's up to us, though, to take the prescription the doctor ordered which is one dose of Jesus Christ and his blood. When he died, he gave the opportunity for every sin to be forgiven. It's up to us to partake in it. It's up to us to say yes. And again, the next day, yes. And if we do, it's forgiven. It's forgotten. And I don't know how he does that because he can't forget anything. That's a mystery to me. I call it selective amnesia, divine selective amnesia. All right. And Simon observed, though, that when these people got baptized that used to listen to him, he observed that something happened. They started acting different. They started talking different. They started thinking different. They didn't come to his little seances anymore. They didn't wait for something to pop up out of the ground like a little minion. They didn't pay him to do things anymore. And he wasn't important anymore. And they began to listen to the preaching of Philip all the time. And they began to try, to try to understand the gospel. And they began to try to tell other people about it. And they began to say what Jesus was doing in their heart. They began to testify. He saw all that. And he said, mm, I better get some if I'm going to be where I stay in power. Simon desired that power for himself as long as it would cost him nothing but money. See, Simon himself believed and he was baptized. That's what it says. <clears throat> so for a minute, he got it right. Just for a minute. What does it say about the seed and the sower? Some falls on rocky ground and some falls in the crags and some falls among the thorns and some falls on semi-good and then some lands on fertile ground. 
right? Where the cares and the worries and the anxieties and the old life come back and try to steal it away. But some yield seed that is 30 and 60 and a hundredfold. What he really wanted though, look what it says. He was amazed by what? The miracles, the signs, and the wonders. More power to change the spiritual and physical realm. What he really wanted was more of what he already had and could profit some more. So his motivation was all wrong. How did the church, though, respond to the news that new believers were in Samaria? Now, listen, Samaritans were not Jew Jews, okay? They were Idumean people mixed with all kinds of people from the region. Their bloodlines were all over the place. That's what my dad used to call a mutt or a Heinz 57. Say, what do you got in you? Well, Irish and Scottish and Polish and German and French, you know. And they really didn't have their own separate way to God, except what they knew of the Jewish religion, that they sort of semi-practiced, but they did things differently. And they added things on and they added things into it that didn't belong there. And so the apostles were amazed that finally some of these people, you know what they were thinking back to? The woman at the well. You remember when Jesus said he had need to go there? Remember that one city that started to believe? Now they're all starting to believe. By the way, what did Jesus say to them? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and then Judea, and then Samaria. And by the way, what's Philip been doing? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. You ever notice how he's been following the plan? Pretty interesting. Now he's in Samaria. And they were so overjoyed, they said, let's send the, let's send the big two. What were the big two in those days? Peter and John. The two of those brothers from the, from the seashore. And they sent out that contingent to affirm and verify that what was happening according to Philip and others was happening. So the apostles went up there and they looked and they watched and they saw. They observed. What did they do as soon as they got to Samaria besides observation? They prayed to see if it was a sincere faith. Holy Spirit, show us. So they got on their knees and they prayed. And then they started to see that the Holy Spirit was there, but he wasn't in all of his fullness. And they said to themselves, these people have an idea of what it means to be free, and they really want to be free, and they've really committed to be free, but they don't have the fullness of the Holy Spirit like we do that came to us on the day of Pentecost when he came in all of his power. And Philip's able to perform these miracles, but they can't. So they prayed for them and prayed over them. They got together big prayer meetings that lasted a long time. Try to get people to do that today. <laughs> Let's pray for 24 hours. What? <laughs> for as yet, the spirit had not fallen on any of them. They'd only received what? Baptism. They'd only received the first gift in the name of the Lord Jesus. And this is what they said to themselves. So we need here to witness to the second gift. The fullness of the Holy Spirit. Baptism by fire from heaven, not water. What did the apostles do to grant this gift? Well, let's take a look. They prayed and then they laid hands. And to this very day, it's done the same way. When a minister or when people come for entire sanctification to receive all the Holy Spirit have, ministers and leaders lay their hands on them. And I'm not kidding you. It's not magic. It's not sorcery. It is if that person really has faith and the person who's supposed to be representing God really has faith, the Holy Spirit comes in all of his power. And I have seen it. I have seen people shake. I have seen people fall down. I have seen people be healed from being in a, in a paralyzed in a wheelchair. I have seen people stand up and testify in tongues. I have seen people go out and heal people in the minute, they're, they're, the minute they get off the altar. I've seen other people with a drug addiction never go back and have one more anything. I could testify to 17 people that I know have done that. Never even tempted again to take drugs. Never even tempted again to take alcohol. Because he came and he came in all of his fullness and he cleansed them entirely. And he took over. That's what the church of the Nazarene was built for. It was built to bring the second gift to every person. Without holiness, here's the negative. No one shall see the Lord. Is that in scripture? It sure is. Hebrews chapter 12. Not, not, with, not, not without sin, no one will see that. Without holiness. Yeah. If people say, well, that can, you know, all the other denominations say, well, you can kind of interpret that word differently. No, you can't. It's righteousness. 
No, you can't. Because you know what it is? Paul was telling us in the book of Hebrews, because I'm sure he wrote it, 99% sure, by the, by the way the words are, you got to go way beyond just getting saved. You got to be transformed into the very image of the Son of God. And he is what? God is holy first. Above love, he is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. What did the angels sing when Isaiah saw them? I know God is love, and thank God he is, or his son wouldn't have came. But, he's God, but God is primarily holy, and he's calling us to be like himself. How many times do you hear this in the Bible? Be you holy as your heavenly father is. How hard is that? Hardest thing in the world. You know what it means? Complete obedience, complete submission, complete laying it down, completely loving God, completely trusting God, completely doing whatever he says, no matter what you think. How hard is that for human beings? Not having a will of your own anymore. I mean, just the thought of that, doesn't that make you like, oh, what? Now, some of you are looking at me and going like, this is the first time I've heard this. That's okay. But how many know in their heart of hearts when I'm preaching this, this is correct? And how many know they need it as I do? And I need more than I ever have before. And I'm not there yet, but I'm glad God does not leave me to myself. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it on the day he returns. Amen? Second Thessalonians. So we pray in the church of Nazarene for complete infilling of the Holy Spirit. We pray for it all the time to receive all that he has. Now, does this mean you'll speak in tongues? Some of you will. Some. Now, here's the other problem with that. Not everybody gets all the gifts. We're not meant to. There are 12 to 20, depending on what you count. Doesn't matter the number. Here it is. God gifts you with the gifts he's given you. If you use them to the fullest, guess what you are? Perfect servant. Guess what you do for the church? You fill in all the places no one else can fill. Amen to that? We are all one body, but we are not all the same part of the body. And you're not supposed to be. And I'm not supposed to be. We're all supposed to fill in the gaps. And we're supposed to, when I went downstairs yesterday and I watched everybody doing their thing and I came up here and, and the other day when we were doing it and the other day when the ladies were prepping crafts and I mean prepping a hundred, like a hundred things at a time, it looked like there was just conversation and joy and the hands were just moving. You know what I thought to myself? This is what it looks like when the Holy Spirit has his way. I go home and I am full of joy when I see all of you doing everything to the gifts that have been given to you because I know that you are becoming all that you can become. Sounds like an army commercial, doesn't it? You know, the old ones that used to be real, like be all you can be. Not the ones today, like you pansy, whatever you want. No, anyway, so. it's unbelievable what they do nowadays. Then they laid hands on them and they received it. Now watch what happens when Simon Magnus checks this out. What does that second baptism look like in the life of a believer? That second gift brings everything. It brings the power to preach, evangelize, teach, convict, pray, and even perform miracles. Sometimes it can be a call in the middle of the night. Someone calls you and says, I've got a leak in my basement. Do you know a good plumber? Yeah, that happened last night. One of our own came home to their house flooded and they called the pastor. Who do you got on call or speed dial? It's 24 hours a day. I won't tell you because it'll be like a public service announcement for that company. I just, and he said, okay. Hour later, they were there. Hour later, it was fixed. Water's flowing out of the basement. Now, is that a gift a normal pastor does? No, but is that what I was supposed to do at that moment? Yes. And did that person's life get blessed? Yes. So what did I do? I performed whatever I had to at that moment. See how simple it is? It doesn't matter what it is. It just matters that, right? It just matters that we do. But it gives us that power to say, not like, are you kidding me with a phone call? You know, that would be a normal attitude, wouldn't it? 
That'd be a worldly attitude. That'd be an attitude of someone who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. The other thing is like, yeah, let me rack. Oh, I got it right here on speed dial. Why? Because it happens to the church. Because it happens to others. Boom. And then I prayed over it. God, send that person quick. Simon observed that the second baptism brought a gift of divine power in the spiritual realm. That's what the, that's what the Greek tells us. He knows that something in heaven and earth has changed. And he knows that whatever that is, is more powerful than anything he's ever seen or understood in his life. And he, watch this, he craved it. He lusted over it. He coveted it. That's the word. Yeah. Wasn't a good thought on his part. So Simon desired it above everything else, no matter what it would cost. And so what did he offer? Something easy. Everybody has a price. How many people have ever heard that? I got news for you. Some of us don't. All right? Some of us just don't. And there's some of us in this room. I bet you all of us in this room. I'll bet you you don't have a price. Because you know what? You've been bought with a price. It's greater than any price. And what did they say? What did the apostles even think? I, I can't even imagine. Well, I, Peter always had a temper, and I could just kind of see it right about now. Are you kidding me? Are you out of your mind? But what did they do after scolding him? What did they offer him to get rebaptized? Let's start over. Let's take you back through the process. I don't think you understood what baptism meant. I don't think you understand what forgiveness and repentance means. Let me try again. They immediately still had a heart for what? His lost soul. See the difference there? There's the one who's infilled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, the rebuke comes. And yes, you put the person in their place. But then you immediately do what? Offer grace, forgiveness, and start over again. You would never stop praying for that lost soul or keep trying. After he rebuked him, he said, repent. And maybe God won't strike you dead, basically is the language in the Greek, because right now you're on really thin ice, buddy. Okay, we know what you are. Because you're what? You're poisoned. Look at this. Poisoned with bitterness, contempt, and bound in your what? Sin. It has not left you. You didn't really understand what you did when you got baptized. And, 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 and Christ's blood has not washed you clean because you really didn't commit to him. You really didn't make him Lord and Savior of your life. A lot of us, you know, when we preach the gospel, we've got to be careful that we don't offer salvation to get out of hell, but we offer salvation and lordship of Jesus Christ. Until he is over us and until we are humbled, there is no true repentance. Once again, that full teaching of the baptisms. What was Simon Magnus's response? Well, was it just misunderstanding? Did he just not understand? That's a possibility. He could have just or was it complete rejection? Only history can tell us the answer. And guess what? Remember I told you he's mentioned again? Who wants to see what happened to Simon Magnus? Raise your hand. I love this stuff. It's history. It's like, it's amazing. I don't even try to change it or tear down statues. I just say what it says. It's just amazing that you can just do that. But Simon did answer what? I think for a moment, his heart was cut. I really believe it. I think just for a brief moment, his heart was cut and he said, oh, please pray with me that this does not befall me. I mean, who would want God to strike him dead right on the spot? Although I hear people say that, I can't come to your church, pastor, the roof will fall down. No, it doesn't work that way. Now back to the rest of the story concerning Simon Magnus. And it takes a while to research this stuff. Is he ever mentioned again? Yes, I told you he was. Where is he mentioned? By Justin Martyr. You know, anybody know who he is? He died, well, got his name Martyr for a reason. Uh, he was one of the early people of the church, great teacher, a uh, great uh, theologian. He tells us that he became the leader of the Simonians, named after who? Simon. So he became the leader of his own little cult. That's right. And it wasn't very little. It had many, many members. They were Gnostics. Does anybody know what Gnosticism means in Greek? Secret knowledge. If you don't have it, you can't be saved. Okay? And I don't care who this offends. But the LDS and the Jehovah Witness, they're cults. 
because you have to have secret knowledge added to the Bible, added to Christ to be saved. What does it say at the end of the book of Revelation? What's one of the, what's the last warning in that book? Do not add or subtract from these books or every plague and every bad thing for all eternity will be put upon your head. It's kind of a dire warning. So what did Paul say many times? If another angel from heaven comes down, that's how Islam got started. That's how LDS got started. That's how Jehovah Witness got started. That's how many religions get started because who's the angel descending? Yeah, the angel of light. Oh yeah, that's his name, not darkness. You see, even if another angel comes, Paul says, even if they teach a new philosophy, if they teach anything you didn't hear from the apostles, don't listen to any of it because you'll be led a what did Jesus say? In the last days, many, many will come in my name saying, I am he. Do not go out to them. Do not listen to them. For many false teachers will come and many, many will fall away in those days. We are entering such times when people speak all kinds of foolishness. Who knows what I'm talking about? They make a lot of money off selling books too. He became a leader in Rome. Guess who put up a statue to him? Claudius and Nero put up another one. Now, is Nero a good guy? Anybody know anything about Nero? He killed more Christians than any other Roman emperor except Domitian years later. He was a very wicked, wicked man. Right? He had both Peter and Paul executed in his lifetime. And here's what the statue says, if you translate it from Latin. Who remembers what Luke said about him when the Samaritans would talk about him? Here is a man who has the power of God in human form. Didn't Luke say that to us this morning? Look what's written on the statue. Can you believe that? By the way, it's on the Tiber River, on the island in Rome. By the way, I was there. I've seen it. So who did Simon Magnus become? In other words, Simon became worshipped by his, by his adherents of the Simonians for his own new faith, for his magic, for his sorcery, for his dark arts, and he was called a demigod. Anybody know what a demigod is? When God comes down and mingles with humanity and leaves you half God, half human. That's what they believed he became. This is in line with Roman pantheons and gods because they follow the Greek ones, right? They're just renamed. Everybody, everybody know that? I'm sure you do that, right? Greek mythology just renamed by Romans. Hermes is Mercury. These have different names. What do they believe? Gods and demigods. Who's Hercules? The son of who? Zeus and the, and the son of an earthly woman. Demigod. They believed in daemons, spirits of the other realm, that possess you. And you say that nowadays to psychiatrists and psychologists and they give you a pill. Right? When the person literally is either oppressed or possessed, sometimes. Simon Magnus supposedly performed magical feats. In the last days of the emperor Nero, he performed his greatest one. He actually flew in heaven for a few seconds, hovering, probably on the backs of demonic angels. It's recorded for us by Roman historians. It's also record, recorded for us by Michelangelo. Everybody knows about Moses and the Piata, where Mary's holding the body of Jesus. You've seen, you've seen these, right? Did you know this one exists? Guess who that is? Simon Magnus, and who's on his back? Satan, tormenting him. Yeah, this story goes way back in Roman lore. And how about this one? Inscribed by another great of the Italian Renaissance. It's a picture of Simon Magnus floating on the backs of demons over Nero's head from the towers of Rome and waving his arms and calling himself God. But then the angels let him go, those fallen angels, and he fell to his death. 
a few seconds later. So it's clear that Simon Magnus contained and retained his power from who? Satan and the demons. It is also clear that he died trying to perform this mighty act. Now, let me tell you what was happening while he was doing this. There were two men on their knees watching it, Peter and Paul. And they were praying for his, sorry folks, demise. That's what the historians tell us. And as they prayed, the Holy Spirit brought him back to earth. And Simon Magnus met his end. He also never repented in his lifetime of his sins. And therefore, he was the constant antagonist until the day of his death to both Peter and Paul in Rome in the early church. And his Simonians went everywhere they went trying to tear down the gospel behind them. You ever wonder why we have all those problems with all the churches and all those letters? Trying to keep all the churches on in track? People like this going behind and undoing what the men of God and the women of God were trying to do. It's the whole history of our early Christianity. Now back to the rest of the story of the early church. That's the bad news. Let's look at the good news and we're done. The last verse. Did you catch it? And so when the apostles had testified and preached the word of God to all those Samaritans, and they had all received the fullness of the Holy Spirit, they preached the good news all the way back to Jerusalem and every Samaritan village they passed. And, and guess what happened? People were saved left and right. Isn't that awesome? Simon didn't stop them. He tried all he could do, but what did they do? They just kept doing what they were supposed to do. And who was triumphant? The Holy Spirit. Please rise. I'm going to pray for you this morning. Let us be like Philip. Let us be like Peter. Let us be like John in those days. Always preaching and teaching the word of the Lord. Offering the gospel of good news to everyone that we meet. So that they may have access to the same God we do. Amen. The same infilling of the Holy Spirit. Praise be to God. That their sins can be forgiven. And let us through our prayer our devotion and our sincerity and conviction offer repentance to every unbelieving friend we meet, every neighbor and every acquaintance. Let us tell them that Simon and the demons are not triumphant, but the angels and Christ and his spirit will set them free. Let us be partakers of both baptisms over and over again with our hearts and our minds that we may receive every good gift that God our Father wants to give us and that we may be full of all of his grace and his love and the indwelling presence to the day we die. To God and to Christ and to the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever, we say all glory belongs to you and we will be faithful disciples and followers. And all of God's people said, By the way, I forgot to announce this because I always do this and my wife will say, you did all that and you forgot. <laughs> I'm going to pass this around. It's going to be out there. You need to sign up to bring food for Friday. We need lots of food for about 125. So as much as you can make, okay? Sorry, public service announcement. Well, we have one final song we'll sing before we go downstairs for, uh, for fellowship this morning. And it's a song that says, Lord, I need you. And just that constant reminder every day, every hour, we need him and we need his presence. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense.
rights, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where your grace is found, is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is grace in me. Where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. To rise to you when temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand up all on you, Jesus, you're my hope and stay, and when I cannot stand up all on you. Jesus, you're my hope and sleep. Lord, I Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you, my one my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Paul's letter to the Colossians, let us have this benediction together. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Lord, bless this people this day. Come in all of your fullness each day to fill them as they walk after you, Lord Christ. May you lead, may we follow, May lives be changed this week because of our faithfulness and yours, O oh Lord. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. For those that want to stay and help, we're going to work right away. You can go down and get some refreshments as well. We have about 25 minutes of work if we all pitch in and we're done. God bless you. Amen.